much like the age-old question, to skinny jean or not to skinny jean, marketing strategies can come and go and come back again. Who can keep up with that? Luckily, there's HubSpot's 2024 State of Marketing Report. It's the all-in-one guide for what's happening this year and how marketers can best approach it all. The report covers everything from increasing awareness and engagement to ensuring privacy, boosting efficiency, and growth. Don't get caught behind the trends, everybody. Visit HubSpot.com slash State of Marketing to get your free copy of the report. Okay, welcome to Wednesday, everybody. It's April 24th. I'm John Weigel here with Mark Dent, and this is The Hustle Daily Show. West Coasters rejoice. Finally, construction has begun on a high-speed train line from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. The $12 billion project has just started this week and is set to finish up around 2028. So how many passengers is train company Brightline West expecting and just how fast does this thing go? We'll get to that in a bit, but first let's run down the hits and headlines today in business and tech. Starting off in space today, Voyager 1 is phoning home. The NASA spacecraft, which is currently 15 billion miles from Earth, is sending readable data for the first time in five months after engineers fixed a communication problem on board. Next, the Federal Trade Commission is suing to stop Tapestry, which owns Coach and Kate Spade, from acquiring Capri Holdings, who owns Versace, Jimmy Choo, and Michael Kors, for $8.5 billion. Regulators think the merger, which would bring six major brands under one umbrella, would create a harmful monopoly. But that's not all the FTC news there was today. Uh, Mark, just before we recorded the podcast, what happened with the FTC? Yeah, the FTC is very busy uh, these days. They voted on Tuesday to ban non-compete agreements, which is a historic vote, actually. Roughly one in five employees have been subjected to a non-compete clause at some point in their career. And, you know, this would more or less make it not allowed for companies to do that. Of course, there are going to be some legal challenges. So who knows if this will actually hold up and it's not like it's going to happen overnight or anything like that anyway. Mm -hmm. But really exciting transition to this new era of non-competes. Didn't think that would happen anytime soon, but look at that. Yeah, and it's kind of one of those things I was earlier today reading the column from someone at Forbes who was trying to say like why it's a bad idea. And I just felt like even while this person was writing out why it's a bad idea arguments, I was like, actually, these sound like arguments for getting rid of (laughs) non-competes. It was just saying like, well, how are employers going to know that they have their employees' loyalty and they won't just leave for a a better paying job? And it's like, well, of course, they don't know that. And so that's why you should pay employees what they're worth, (laughs) et cetera. So I think it's going to have a lot of people happy that the FTC did this, but we'll see how well it holds up to legal challenges. Yeah. Up next, insurance behemoth United Health Group said that a ransomware attack earlier this year on Change Healthcare led to private health data and personal information being stolen from a, quote, substantial portion of Americans. So look out, everybody. Following up, a Tesla driver was charged with vehicular manslaughter after killing a motorcyclist. He claimed he wasn't paying attention because he trusted the car's, quote, autopilot mode, which still requires an attentive driver, much as we discussed yesterday with Catherine. And lastly, Spotify, after trimming over 1,500 employees, saw a record $179 million quarterly profit in Q1. But CEO Daniel Ek admitted covering for thousands of now missing workers managed to, quote, disrupt the music streamers daily operations more than expected. Mark, what do you think about this profitability? But after that immense layoff that we had earlier this year at Spotify. Well, it's really interesting because Spotify, of course, has you know rarely been profitable. It's had some profitable quarters, but it has not really strung too many of them together in a row and you know, obviously not had one with nearly as much profit as this one. And I think that it really shows that Wall Street just continues to reward layoffs. It's it's frankly an unfortunate fact of the corporate world is that when companies lay people off, their stock tends to go up. Now, this, of course, showed like a profitability after mass layoffs, which is another reason why it went up. But it could, though, in, in some ways be a turning point for Spotify. A lot of these employees, of course, received severance for several months. So it's not like Spotify, you know, just became profitable purely because of these layoffs. Like they were still paying out severance, which, you know, is roughly equal to these salaries. So I don't know. I think that it goes without saying when you lose 1,500 employees, you're going to like find some things harder to do 
And so maybe there's going to be more challenges ahead for Spotify, but I think this is a really kind of surprising amount of profit and could be a sign of maybe Spotify finally getting it together. Yeah, we'll see how it holds up next quarter. I'm interested to see how a lot of factors will affect them over time, including their lesser work staff. And also, of course, I got to profit off those Taylor Swift streams, right? Next quarter. Yeah. All right. Today, our main story is about what many are calling the first high-speed rail in the United States. The $12 billion construction project on the Las Vegas to LA line began this past Monday, and it'll be at least four years until passengers can actually use it. But first, Mark, who's building this train and how large is the task in front of them? So it's being built by Brightline West, a private company that has public-private kind of arrangements for this particular project and has a sister company that already operates a train between Miami and Orlando, albeit not one quite as fast as this, not like high speed, if you will. And it is certainly a large task in front of them. I mean, you're talking about $12 billion. It's going to go obviously from LA to Las Vegas, which is about 218 miles. They're going to try and do it in, you know, three or four years in hopes of having it ready in time for the Summer Olympics of 2028, Mm -hmm. which are happening in Los Angeles. Now, that said, I actually think the hardest task is behind them, which is securing the funding and snipping the ribbon. Because most of the time when we've talked about high-speed rail in this country, it's never even gotten to this stage. It is still going to be difficult to actually keep this project on time and on budget, as is often the case with a lot of projects, but especially with rail in this country. But this is something that a lot of people didn't think would happen in any time in the coming years. So this is a pretty big deal. I mean, yeah. Can you blame them? I mean, back in 2008, 20 years before this train is set to be done, there was an approval on a 500 mile train from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And, you know, I don't really live on the West Coast, but I ain't seen it yet. So it's it's definitely not there. Getting the profit for these things is tough and putting them through. You're right. Very much so in that cutting the ribbon is tough and starting the work is tough. Have there been a lot more problems with rail in the U.S. concerning gathering this sort of funding because, you know, things like Amtrak has been trying to do this for a long time. Yeah, there's been a lot of different issues. And some of them, like, for instance, with Amtrak, which has had the capability for, again, not what we would consider like high speed rail, like where you're talking, you know, nearly 200 miles an hour, you know, like you might see in like Japan or Europe, but faster than like, say, the Acela corridor, Mm -hmm. which goes from like DC up the East Coast right now. I mean, Amtrak, they've had different plans for trains that are supposed to go faster than the Acela. And it just doesn't really happen, both because of funding issues or just issues with the track itself. Most of the tracks that Amtrak currently runs on, they cannot handle these really fast trains. Mm -hmm. Until recently, when the U.S., in large part through some of the Biden administration's and Congress's efforts over the last couple of years, it was really hard to even have the supplies that you would need for tracks and rail cars like this. But mainly there was just a lot of opposition and inertia. In general, it's hard to get people to care about trains, especially high-speed trains, Mm -hmm. when most people don't even go on trains unless you live on the East Coast. And so then when you think about high-speed trains, it sounds like, whoa, 200-mile-an-hour trains. It sounds like (laughs) fantasy talk. In Texas, where I live, around 35, 40 years ago, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was like this huge project to have a high-speed rail between Dallas and Houston. And I mean, it was really kind of shepherded by the government and it had a lot of backing, but Southwest Airlines was a huge opponent to it. And so that kind of helped scuttle those plans. Mm -hmm. In more recent years, there was talk of bringing back the idea of Dallas to Houston high-speed rail, but this time there was a lot more of kind of grassroots opposition where landowners who are typically okay with eminent domain coming through for like oil lines and things of that nature were not okay with high-speed rail. And that's just the case in like almost all of the country. Yeah, certainly. When you mention airports as well, Las Vegas airport is notoriously one of the most active airports in the United States, receiving passengers from everywhere, including Los Angeles. And also the automobile industry may feel something from this, if not only less traffic, because about 44,000 cars per day cross the California Nevada state line in 2023. So those numbers are huge. And hopefully in four or so years, That'll change. But do you know how many passengers they're expecting on this new rail? I mean, they're talking about a lot, some 30,000 per day, potentially, which would be about 11 million one way passengers per year. And, you know, you're talking about fares. The only way that something like this works 
is if the fares are consistently at least a little bit below airline costs. Mm -hmm. And that's tended to be how like high speed rail has worked well in Europe. I mean, if you're there, you can go from, you know, Paris to London, you can go London to Amsterdam, et cetera. And it just takes a few hours, which is, you know, maybe about the same time as a flight or, or actually just, you know, maybe a little bit longer even, but it's just, it's more convenient. Sure. I think one thing that America has long missed out on, and I think that this is pretty significant, especially for when you're talking about from LA to Las Vegas, is not just you're going to avoid some traffic if you don't drive, but flight-wise, it's just like you drive out somewhere out in the suburbs to go to an airport, and then you land somewhere else in the suburbs, and you're talking city-to-city connection here. And yeah, that's like when I used to live on the East Coast, like I loved being able to go from a 30th Street station in Philadelphia up to Penn Station in New York, and you're immediately in the city. And, you know, especially for people who want to go to Vegas, like I know that airport's not far from the Strip, to say the least, but it right. will still be nice to just kind of walk out and be there, I think. Yeah, it would be. And this train line is going to have connections to very close to the Vegas Strip and to downtown LA. And I don't know if we mentioned, but this train is supposed to go 186 miles and cut the commute from four hours from Vegas to LA to just above two. So, I mean, I'm definitely all for more trains in this country. There's been a huge move towards sleeper trains as well. So I don't know, maybe we'll have some capabilities of this going cross country sometime in the future if anybody can get the funds together. Well, I mean, that's like what people are kind of talking about with this. And of course, it's like rosy, optimistic projections. But, you know, the the, the backers of this project are saying that this is going to be the beginning of true high speed rail in the U.S. And certainly the Biden administration has made rail like a huge thing. And when they're talking about trying to be, you know, net neutral in terms of like carbon emissions by 2050, this is a huge part of that is having a lot more rail because it does take away a lot of emissions that you would see you know, both on the road to some extent, but especially in the air, if you can avoid a lot of these kind of short range flights. I mean, I love trains. Like, Same. I mean, most people do. Like, that's the thing. There are very few people who like hypothetically like, well, would you rather drive from Dallas to Houston or like LA to Las Vegas or get there in half the time for less than you'd pay for a flight? And you can look out the window and be fairly comfortable and be on Wi-Fi the whole time. Right. I mean, very few people would say no to that. Right. And in some cases, if you're leaving Vegas, horribly hungover. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Sounds like a good deal. I'm just waiting for them to build the New York to Texas train line so you and I can meet up in the middle somewhere. Oh, I know. Yeah. Just get that in, you know, 15 hours or something like that. It'd be perfect. Yeah. No, no big deal. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to the Hustle Daily Show today. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig, and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email, and we will see you tomorrow. Hey, everybody, this great new podcast just came out and I can't wait to tell you about it. It's called The Next Wave AI in the Future of Technology, and it's hosted by Matt Wolf and Nathan Lands. And of course, it's brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. You can catch The Next Wave with Matt Wolf and Nathan Lands, who are leading AI creators who are your guiding light in the AI and technology frontier. AI technology is transforming the way we do business and the media landscape is a bit fragmented, but the next wave strives to be the leading podcast on AI technology and how you can apply it to growing your business. You can listen to the next wave wherever you get your podcasts.